I moved to Syria in 2009. I stayed there until the war broke out in 2011. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was beginning a journey in education. I began life in Syria as a humble computer scientist. Now I build and design education technology, and I want to share with you the power and importance of this world and the duty that we have in ensuring that it works for us. So, back to 2009. When I moved to Syria, I knew almost nothing about it. I just knew that I wanted to go there and study Arabic. But I fell in love with Damascus immediately. The smell of Hustuk al Hamadiya, the taste of Bekdash ice cream, the feeling of warmth from the people I met. I rented a house that looks across all of Damascus. I could listen to the call to prayer, listen to it slowly make its way from mosque to mosque across the city. And slowly, I learned what the words mean, how the people are called to pray. My favorite ones are sung at dawn. They mean, come to pray, come to pray. Prayer is better than sleep. That's what it says. Prayer is better than sleep. I took their word for it. Early on, though, I was struggling. Arabic has a really complicated structure, and it means that for every one word in English, you have to learn two or three words in Arabic. And when my teacher said to me one day, Leishma Tudros, which means, why don't you study? I knew something was wrong with my method. Every night I was studying hours and hours and hours. But for some reason, I wasn't learning. And I remember I was, I was getting out my word list and I was covering the words up and I was testing myself. And mostly I got it right. And I guess that was part of the problem. You can't really test yourself when you're just covering up words from one minute, one minute ago. So I got out my, my laptop, I connected my dial-up internet, and I did some research. I discovered flashcards. It's a really simple device. You have one English word on one side and the corresponding Arabic words on the other. You put them all in an envelope, you take out that envelope on one day, and then you test yourself. And if you get it right, you put them into another envelope. If you get a word right five times in a row, you've learned it. Now, I didn't even know how to say envelope, much less want to fiddle about with all of these envelopes. So I did what every self-respecting computer scientist might do, and I thought I could write an app to solve this problem. I made myself a little flashcard app. I coded up the user interface. I added the words. But most importantly, I decided when and how often words flashed up to, flashed up to me. I even researched this thing called spaced repetition to ensure that I put those words into my long-term memory. But what was I really learning? I was remembering the words. But could I use them? Could I use them in speech? Could I understand them when spoken? In truth, my language learning app, my flashcard app, it was just a beginning. I researched all these other tools. I came across Duolingo and Rosetta Stone. But ultimately, they were just the same as mine, they were just this kind of pattern matching tool. They pose learning as a problem to be solved without social context and then set about solving it, as though it's just a problem for engineers. It felt to me like there weren't really any teachers or pedagogy experts in the design room. So I became one. I taught English in Syria, in Damascus, in Melbourne and in Sydney. I even taught asylum seekers on Christmas Island. That's another story. I read book after book after book about teaching and learning, and I applied what I learned each day in the classroom. It turns out that apps like Duolingo are based on an old and fundamentally discredited form of teaching known as grammar translation. The idea behind it is that if you can translate enough words, enough sentences, enough paragraphs into another language, then you can speak it, right? Turns out not really. And the other part of Duolingo is repetition. Drilling. It's a kind of behavioralism, the idea that just acting out the actions of an expert makes you an expert. But if you imagine your Korean speaking wife telling you to take out the darn rubbish, please, does she really want you to say right back to her, take out the darn rubbish, please? Or does she just want you to take out the darn rubbish? Modern language teaching is about using the language, not just being drilled again and again. Now, Duolingo have attempted to take on some of these criticisms. And if you look carefully under each sentence, there's a little discuss button. And it's an attempt to bring in some kind of um, social constructivist learning. But 
really, their heart's not in it. Users keep using, the user base grows, revenue increases. But this is not a bad thing. Do not misunderstand me here. Technology can be a huge multiplier for learning. It's just that we need to recognize that Duolingo's aims are different to ours. Duolingo wants us to increase our engagement with the app rather than the world. Our aim is to increase our engagement with the world, using the app as a tool. So how might apps like Duolingo help us do this instead? Here are some possibilities. At the start of the day, Duolingo could ask you, what are your aims or what are your goals? And then it could set you challenges to achieve that day. At the end of the day, it could ask you how long you've spent using the language. Then a new aim for users and designers alike becomes maximizing the ratio between using the language and time spent in the app, because we know that's what drives learning. And what about the context, your context, outside the technology? A key part of learning is connecting it to what we already know. Sometimes what we already know can help us learn. Other times our preconceptions can hinder us. There's a lovely fable, it's called Fish is Fish. It's about this really, really curious fish who's desperate to know what life is like on land. So he befriends a frog who, of course, one day goes to land and then comes back. And he sits, he sits the fish down. He says, fish, I've, I've been to land and this is what I saw. I saw a bird flying around. I saw a bull sitting in the paddock with horns. I saw a human all dressed up with somewhere to go. And the fish nodded, nodded very, very wisely with that same feeling of learning that we've all had at some time. And he swam away thinking in his mind's eye about a fish with wings swimming along, another fish with horns, and a final fish that was all dressed up in a top hat and a suit, but somehow swing up, swimming upright. The point is, context is important. Duolingo doesn't know what you already know or what you don't know or what preconceptions you might need to break in order to help you learn. In fact, the gamification principles behind Duolingo mean that it's, it's better if you get most of your answers right because that's what will keep you coming back, confident that you'll get all the answers right the next time you open the app. But sometimes you need to take a risk. Sometimes you need to do something like go to a bar, go to a pub, maybe even tell a joke in a pub because there are plenty of bars and pubs in Syria. Now, think back to your last technology-based learning experience. Was it a slide and video-based piece of compliance training at work? How do you work differently now? Was it watching your kid lose themselves on an educational iPad game or even one that isn't educational but has supposed benefits for learning? Were links made in class back to logic or to reasoning? Another way of looking at this is how do these companies judge themselves? What are their metrics? Engagement, engagement, app opens, sign-ups, that's what drives revenue. And even in education, we have this thing called education analytics, but ultimately it's so often just app, uh, page opens, time spent on a page, time spent on a page. How do we know that they weren't just confused? I know there is a growing movement in the world around humane technology, and that's a great thing. But the technology companies, they always have an out. Who doesn't want ads that are more personalized to them rather than just random? Why shouldn't you get a notification about cat videos while you're trying to read Wikipedia? After all, that's what engages you. But education technology is different. Values matter. Learning helps us act positively within this world. It helps us understand this world. It helps us solve today's problems and it helps us get ready for tomorrow's problems. And all the big companies are making big bets on education. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Google. They know that today's students are tomorrow's customers, tomorrow's workers. The potential power of these giants is immense. But how do we ensure that they design in a way that helps us connect with the world, not disconnect? Do they design with humility? 
Or are they arrogantly separate, thinking that they can own and control the entire learning process all for themselves? As education technology seeps further and further into our world, we should ensure that these companies treat our minds and treat our kids' minds like the precious things they are, where the technology is designed just to play a role, a role in learning, a role in our lives, where the technology helps us engage as well as disengage, where it's purposefully designed to help us connect to the rest of the world and helps us realize our potential, where it helps us not just memorize words in Arabic, but connect to those who speak it. Shukran Katir.